Today, I'm speaking with Bill Zersher. Bill, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. And I just wanted to give everyone a brief bio for, for Bill. Uh, Bill studied economics at Yale. Uh, he worked in the energy field and has also been a teacher. Uh, he's the author of a book that we're going to discuss a little bit later on called Seeing Through Christianity, a Critique of Beliefs and Evidence. He has a YouTube channel, which I'll link right beneath our video if you want to check it out. Uh, he's been an activist for the separation of church and state. And he also does a fantastic job with his, his uh, book and his videos, providing a critical overview of Christian beliefs and explaining the origins and early evolution of those beliefs. And could you tell us a little bit more about uh, just what you've been up to in the last few years? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, the book is a, the book is a, a few years old, and it was, a, it was a pretty big project for me. I, I spent uh, a number of years in the, in the corporate world and then um, left that because I had an interest in teaching. Hmm. And I'm here in California. You have to have a, if you're gonna teach in the public schools, you have to have a teaching credential. So I had to take a couple of semesters of uh, coursework on teaching. And I think I had a flair for it to begin with, but I definitely learned, learned some things. And I wanted to teach high school math. Uh, which is kind of different. Um, I figured, you know, there's always a need for math teachers, but um, I never got hired. And that's an interesting episode. Um, you might speculate that that might have been because of some of my um, atheist activities and um, um, memberships and, and, and correspondence. Could have also been because I was older and because I've got a, a master's degree, they would have had to pay me more than some of the 23-year-olds coming out with teaching credentials. This was back when, during the, uh, during the crisis, when California was shedding teachers. So a very interesting time. And what happened was I, uh, I wound up getting a job tutoring in a tutoring center. And it was great. Mm -hmm. I just fell in love with it. Working with the kids one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, no lesson plans, no no state paperwork uh, to be completed. And I'd get, I'd get the kids and I'd work with them maybe in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, maybe senior year. And they'd be telling me about getting their driver's licenses and showing me pictures of their prom. Then they'd go off to college and the mom would come in with the little brother or sister. So I actually had legacy students hmm. that I had. So I, I felt awesome. like a member of of the families in some cases. It was a lot of fun. But during that time, I was also very interested in, in religion. Um, I, my, my education was in public policy, economics and government. And I was always re you know, really interested in the, the places where those things intersected. And you know, in, my, in my career, I, I, I spent 10 years abroad, um, seven years in London and three years in Moscow. Oh. And when I came back to the United States intermittently, I would kind of notice things that might not have been obvious to someone who was here the whole time. So it's, it's like the old story of if you put a frog in a kettle and you gradually turn up the heat, the frog will boil to death. But if you drop, drop a frog into boiling water, he'll leap out immediately, right? So I would come back and all of a sudden be exposed to American culture. And I noticed uh, the, the, the prominent uh, role and the privileged role that religion seemed to be playing in our public square. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that bothered me. And I'd always been interested, you know, this goes back to education, issues like teaching evolution or prayer in school. And so I started thinking more about those issues. And I decided, well, rather than focus on, on, on one particular issue, why not dive in to try to get to the root of this. And so that's when I started researching the background of, of Christianity, um, its historical and philosophical development. And that's kind of what led me to then writing the book and doing a few of the presentations that you've mentioned. Yeah, it's, it's it, at the, the video, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, to our viewers is, is absolutely uh, beyond amazing. It is helpful. It is, it is a quick, it, it moves fast. Uh, you'll 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 spend 90 minutes and it'll blow by before you realize it and your jaw will drop. Um, I did just want to want to mention. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a couple more questions about what you're up to these days. But since we're talking about the video, I just want to make make sure it's clear to people that video has some of the most important information for these discussions, and it's very personal to me. Um, I was a Christian for 43 years, and about um, 
17 months ago or so, I deconverted from Christianity after about 18 months of a very deep dive into subjects like this. And one of the most important videos in that process for me was watching you talk about seeing through Christianity, uh, starting with the, with the church that looks like a chicken. <laughs> um, <laughs> it just, I'm glad, I'm glad you found the video so helpful. It's just, I'm delighted to hear that. So uh, and I appreciate e the plug. I can <laughs> I've easily watched it a, 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 oh, well over a dozen times. It may be several dozen at this point. Um, it's wow. truly, it, I would say if, if, if this was, um, more of a conversation that almost be, you know, uh, just face, if it was face to face, I'd almost choke up at how much it's meant to me. Um, I go back to it probably at least once every month or two, just to kind of remind myself of what this is all about. And um, if, if anyone watching, it's my last plug for it. If, if you haven't seen it before, the link will be right beneath this video. If you don't get anything else from this video, make sure you take the time to watch um, Bill walk through where Christianity came from. It is amazing. And I'm sure it's, it's, I'm sure it felt like the tip of the tip of the iceberg because there's so many more layers, layers to it. But in some ways that's, it was awesome because you took so many layers, you know, you can go into so many little branches of, you know, let's talk about Josephus, let's talk about, you know, all these other sources and all these other influences. But at the end of the day, a lot of people don't have the time or the the background to understand it all. And so they need someone like you to just say, let's just simplify it. Let's put it all on base level. So we all, we all can talk about the same, same baseline here. This is where it came from and you did an amazing job. So thank you again for, for all that you did. Thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about 3000 years of history, um, there's obviously a lot of material and I really kind of stopped the, the description with the primitive church. Um, yeah. So I talked about, polytheism in the Old Testament and then the uh, apocalyptic Judaism and early Christianity and coming from the Greek and Roman influences. But, you know, there's a whole other story to be told in terms of the development of Christian doctrine with, with the, uh, the church fathers and the early church councils and how all this stuff was, was hammered out. So really, I, I really kind of, there's still 2000 years <laughs> yet yeah. to describe and, uh, in Maybe that'll minutes. be a future project. Uh, I don't. I don't know. There's, there's so much, as you said. There's so much to, and so many different directions you can you can yeah. dive into. Well, the video definitely whets your appetite for more. It it, it makes you want to say, it, it, you you leave us wanting, saying, we know you know more than this. Ninety minutes gave us. What else do you know? So we uh, we lo I love on that note to um to you know to to find some way to, to have you more involved in some of the conversations. I saw you just posted another video about Zoroastrianism. Um, thank you so much for, for your research and for your presentations. Um, so the more you put out, the more we'll watch. <laughs> we oh, that, love it. That, that's great to hear. Yeah. Um, I have a, the video I recently put out on Zoroastrianism and it's kind of a, uh, it's not a live presentation. It's a presentation that I've given and nobody ever came up with a very good recording of it. Mm -hmm. And I figured now that we're in, in lockdown because of the coronavirus, I, you know, I don't know when I'll have an opportunity to give the presentation. So I sort of put it out there uh, in a kind of a low tech manner, uh, but at least the material is there. Yeah. Um, there are a number of other topics that I have spoken about in the past and that have not been recorded. Um, one, of which, one of them is about the virgin birth. Mm. Uh, and I call it that there's something about Mary. And uh, it's a really fun topic because the whole issue of miraculous births is something that was uh, obviously a very big topic in the ancient Mediterranean world. And so it enables us to kind of broaden the conversation and talk about other gods and goddesses and, and what was going on in their stories. Hmm. So that there's a lot awesome. more material and I hope to, to do something with the virgin birth sometime in the next six to 12 months. Yeah, uh, but awesome. my more recent interest, I think I, I indicated to you is uh, I've been looking into some philosophical uh, issues. Uh, I guess I should back up. Uh, when, when people ask me, well, what are you? You know, it, it depends on how much time I have. If I'm, just, if I'm just in the elevator, I say, well, I'm an atheist. Uh, but if I've got time to talk uh, more expansively, I, I give a little bit more nuance. Um, Saying you're an atheist is a quick way of conveying that you, you're not buying into organized religion. But if you step back and look at you know, the deeper philosophical questions, is there a God? 
Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying I know the answer to that question. So I consider myself to be both an atheist and an agnostic. Right. Because atheism and theism have to do with belief and agnosticism and Gnosticism, at least in its modern Huxley uh, sense, has to do with knowledge. So I don't believe, but I don't know. Right. right. And um, You're open to the evidence. It, it's interesting hearing, you know, people's stories. Everybody comes from a different place. And I didn't have a real struggle. Uh, I know some people have a terrible time deconverting from um, childhood indoctrination. Um, that really wasn't the case for me. I mean, I grew up in a family that was nominally Christian, but not particularly observant. And uh, was there any neighbor, particular denomination that, that they affiliated um, with? My father was Lutheran and my mother was Christian scientist. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So, yeah, that's right. You, it's astonishing. I, I lived through childhood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, um, the neighborhood was um, for an American suburb in the early 60s was quite diverse in that it had Protestants, Catholics and Jews. Obviously, by a, by worldly standards, it's not very diverse. Um, but it was it was a fairly diverse um, situation, and I didn't really think much, you know, about about religion. It just wasn't uh, top of mind. And I can remember, you know, being like in in sixth grade, and having these sort of philosophical thoughts, like, "Well, what's the past? Like, where where is it?" <laughs> and um, well. Is everything that's going to happen in the future? Is like, if I were really smart, could I figure that out? Or is that like unknown? You know, so, and I don't know. You you could kind of take you you could say that. Well, I was having these proto theistic <laughs> perspective on these questions, and I can remember, you know, quite um, ex, you know, quite consciously thinking to myself it's impossible to answer these questions. And so it's kind of a waste of time thinking about them. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and, and so my interest was always kind of history and economics and, and, and public policy and having a career and so on. But as I've gotten older, I've kind of come full circle and found you know, those philosophical questions coming back to me. Oh, well, maybe I, maybe I can spend some more time thinking about those. Maybe, maybe, Maybe maybe I can make a little bit of progress, even if I can't if I can't solve them. So yeah. that's kind of you know a, a thumbnail of where I've where I've been. It sounds amazing too, in the sense of like kind of going back to the roots of it all. Like you you seem to really have a, a, a clear passion and a, and a goal for saying this isn't just about political dialogue. This is about getting back to the root of it. Like, let's not hack at the, at the limbs. Let's hack at the root of it. The root of it right. is, you know, mythology that has been basically institutionalized and, and culturally accepted across the board. Um, I just, I love that you're going for the, the real you know, source of this whole thing. Um, could I ask in, in terms of your, your upbringing, were you ever presented with the clear gospel uh, in terms of uh, being invited to trust Jesus as your savior? No, no. Um, and of course, I was, I, as I think Curly from the Three Stooges said, I was born quite young. Um, I don't recall, uh, we went to a Lutheran church when I was a youngster, and I don't recall that they, I don't think they did that. Um, and I, nor do I recall any kind of strict catechismic type, you know, training like of the sort that the Roman Catholic church has um <clears throat> my parents and i later found out that my father was having both my parents my father in particular was having his own questioning about whether he really believed some of this stuff and i think in retrospect he was taking me out of a of a of a, of a sense that he wanted me to have some exposure so that i could make up my own mind oh. and uh, there was a, awesome. a very pivotal moment uh, a fun story uh, my dad had been in church and I had been in Sunday school. And so he picked me up and we're driving home. And I said, hey, you know, he, he asked me, well, what'd you talk about in Sunday school? And I said, oh, we, we talked about the story where the baby Moses, they put the baby Moses in a, in a raft and 
<clears throat> floated them down the river. And the, <clears throat> the woman said a prayer for him. <clears throat> and I said, well, why would he need to have a prayer said for him? You know, for his sins. He was a little baby. He could, couldn't possibly have hurt anyone. <clears throat> and my father, I remember to this day, excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. <clears throat> my father said, I don't know, and you're not going back there. And that was the end of my formal, my formal education. So well, I started asking questions, but I didn't have to ask too many. I guess I was pushing on an open door. That, um, can I just say that's awesome? I mean, how many people I'm sure you've come across, and I've certainly come from that background where it's a whole different ball game. You, you, yes. you don't have any opportunity, or even you're just so sheltered, the questions just get so um, apologetically uh, dealt with in a way that it's, you know, that anything that seems ridiculous, they, they make it sound logical and it's all, all explained away. And any kind of doubt is, is basically looked at as, as a ridiculous choice. I mean, how can you understand and fathom the amazing ways of God? If you do have questions that don't add up to you, it's just because you don't understand God yet. And in, at the end of the day too, he's the King. So you can't question him. What a great thing to raise kids to say, you know, not, not necessarily what to think, but just how to think, how to think through it. That's yeah, awesome. I mean, when I hear, when I hear the, the stories that some people have gone through, it's really just, it's heartbreaking. Uh, yeah. um, mm. How they either have to live for a long time pretending or they don't pretend and they wind up getting disowned uh, or, or various degrees of, of uh, um, social punishment is sort of inflicted on them. Yeah. You know, and I talked about um, religion. Um, and I, it, it's a complicated question because religion is bound up in culture and culture is bound up in societal stability. And, um, you know, you, if, if you ask, you know, what would be my ideal outcome? I'd like to see religion go away, but gradually, because it's kind of like, what's that game where you, you pull the blocks out. Uh, uh, Jenga? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying not to make the... Yeah, you know, uh, I worry about pulling too many blocks out of, you know, because religion is is so central to most civilizations. You just have to be careful yeah. that you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And <clears throat> I'm not... I think it was the, the Greek historian Polybius said that um, if all men were philosophers... We wouldn't need religion, yeah. but as they clearly are not, <laughs> as they clearly are not, you know, and, um, and I actually, um, you know, I, I'm actually fond of some traditions. Um, I'm not, I don't consider myself hostile tradition to tradition for tradition's sake. Um, I was thinking recently about something, um, you know, American in the courtroom, judges wear black robes. I mean, what's the, so? What's the deal with that? And and I mentioned I lived in 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 London for a number of years. Of course, you can go down to the Old Bailey and watch trials, and not only the judges, but the barristers have black robes, and they, they wear white wigs, you know. And so the utilitarian in me is saying, well, what's the deal with the wigs and the and the black robes? And I can remember hearing an interview with <laughs> with one of the barristers, and he said. Uh, I like I like the wigs, he says, and uh, the defendants and the prisoners like the wigs too. And then he said, no one wants to be sent to prison by a guy in a t-shirt. <laughs> and I, I've always, I always thought that was great, you know, that the, the robe and the wig, well, it actually, it represents the state, you know, you're, you're, you're in a role, you're not, you're not some guy off the street, you're, you're playing a role. Yeah. So uh, I wear my, I'm digressing about tradition, but so not all traditions are bad. I think, you know, there's, there's a role for tradition. Yeah. Um, and I think we just have to be, we have to be thoughtful about our traditions and, and, and what's come down to us from the past. Yeah, if I was actually speaking with someone last night, a very wise gentleman uh, named James Valiant. Uh, he wrote a book called Creating Christ, but we were just chatting and uh, doing some planning together. And he was talking about something similar about having the attitude where you can still, you know, respect 
uh, history and, and not just be uh, you know sarcastic or, or rude to people about it. And to, he was mentioning the idea of being able to to hear Ave Maria or look at you know the beautiful stained glass window in a cathedral, and you know to not bring in theism into it, but to still have a sense of the the awe and the wonder of life that that you know we should all be able to appreciate the artwork that has been created and the beauty. And it is true. It's there's you wouldn't want to throw it out. I I, I agree with you. I would love to see it dissipate in some way. Um, not sure how soon that's going to happen, but. Well, that's an interesting question, right? Because, um, you know, you read the polls about the rise of the nuns. Uh, but, you know, that religion addresses some deep um, desires that human being had some deep desires, fears, um, you know, even leaving aside the whole social cohesion issue. So it's a it's a it's a complicated um, it's a complicated picture. Yeah. Could I ask real quick, just I don't want to take too much more time about the early parts of your story, but with your mother being a Christian scientist, do you recall any of their tenets uh, or what that, maybe even the application of what that looked like in your life uh, growing up? Or was it more as a, a side issue, like she believed it, but didn't practice it? How did that look to you? Yeah, I think she was more a Christian scientist by, by birth. Her, her parents were practitioners. Um, and they resisted doctors and hospitals and, and things like that. And of course, um, there, you know, every year there are stories of people dying because they refuse medical treatment and even worse of children dying because their parents refuse medical treatment on their behalf. Um, mm. so you have, you know, you have terrible things like that, um, Excuse me, but my mother, uh, no, she, she, she did not hesitate to uh, uh, avail herself of, of modern medicine. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and going to um, the, the gospel again, did you, as you grew up and, you know, went to college and, you know, made bigger and bigger contacts and circles of, of friends and, and, and work acquaintances, did you have anyone that they kind of presented you with more of the evangelical Christian gospel ever? And, and give you an invitation, like a, a Billy Graham kind no, of conversation? I can, no, I can remember seeing Billy Graham on television and thinking that this guy was from another planet. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I kind of came of age, you know, I, I went to high school and college during the, the very secular 70s, uh, even though I enjoyed the music of Godspell <laughs> and Jesus Christ Superstar, um, which were both, I guess, products of the 70s. Um, you know, people who were very earnest about Christianity were disparaged as Jesus freaks. You may, you may, you may recall the term. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I never took it really seriously until I counter, encountered it from the standpoint of what was going on politically in our country. Mm. Um, and you know, uh, what's the old saying that uh, hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, with the exception of stupidity. <laughs> um, I, and I don't, and I don't mean I don't mean to be arrogant. I, I I can be just as stupid as the next guy, but we really need to emphasize critical thinking in our in our education. You know, I mean, it just comes back to my interest in, in the importance of education and, you know, the, um, the need for critical thinking. Uh, and I don't want to get too political here, but, you know, we had, there are people in the country right now who sincerely believe that Donald Trump won the 2020 presidential election. I mean, they actually think that. And it's, it's right. So then you ask, well, <laughs> some of those same people will say, well, surely the Gospels are accurate. <laughs> Infallible. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I wanted to read you. Um, I set this aside. I hope you don't mind if I read Please. this. Yeah. Um, there's a quote here. <clears throat> In the big lie, there is always a certain force of credibility because the broad masses of a nation are always more easily corrupted in the deeper strata of their emotional nature than consciously or voluntarily. And thus in the primitive simplicity of their minds, they more readily fall victims to the big lie than the small lie. 
a grossly impudent lie always leaves traces behind it, a fact which is known to all expert liars in this world. So that's, uh, that's Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf, chapter 10. Um, and, you know, there are, there are conscious practitioners of that uh, afoot today. Mm -hmm. um, now, let's talk about the Gospels. I'm not, I'm not saying that the people who were involved were deliberately lying. Right. I'm just saying um, you have a story coming out. The story takes place in a pre-scientific setting where the vast majority of the people were illiterate. Several generations pass, and versions of the oral tradition get written down in a language alien to the language from which they sprang, right? Because the Gospels were written in Greek and the stories were told in Aramaic. And then, of course, we don't have any original versions of those. So our, you know, our earliest fragments are like fragments of John from 120 common era, give or take a couple of decades. And that's no bigger than a, my palm. It's not like the whole gospel. Right. Um, so, um, you know, to sort of organize your whole life around th these vestiges of stories that were copied and rewritten and interpolated and translated, um, it, it just, it's just, it's astonishing to me. Um, Yes. I keep going back to the idea that, you know, if, if, there is, if there is a God who wants us to know, um, why would he leave us in any doubt about, about that? Yeah. And, and, and do such a poor uh, job at this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Apologists will sometimes say, well, you know, they want, there needs to be a role for faith. God stays just hidden enough so that, you know, you have to want to find him. And uh, um, they'll say things like, well, if you had incontrovertible proof of God's existence, um, yeah, if you had, then. It's not really faith at it that would point. Take away your, it would take away your free will to believe in him and to follow him. Now, there's some obvious problems with that, right? Because Adam and Eve had incontrovertible proof <laughs> of God's existence. They talked to him, and yet they still disobeyed him. Satan, presumably, you know, according to the Christian story itself, Satan knew pretty well uh, Yahweh, and yet he, according to the story, uh, re rejected him. So that's proof that knowing that God exists doesn't remove your free will to follow him or not. Yeah. In fact, the beauty is that it would remove the excuse of ignorance. If we had incontrovertible proof, then everyone, then the ignorance excuse would be eliminated and everyone could make a clear choice based on that clear evidence. Yeah. So it seems to me the whole, the whole thing doesn't hang together on, on a lot of different levels. Yeah, and even all of Israel's history is very similar. Where uh, supposedly the the God of Israel did demonstrate his his voice and his power, you know, leading them as a you know cloud by day and, and a, a pillar of fire by night, and um, all the other things you know, parting the Red Sea, and yet you know they inst instantaneously turn to you know making a, a golden calf and all that stuff. And it's like if you have God's proof, it it's it wouldn't work the way you think it would. But it's interesting too the the, what I what I love about too what you're doing is you're, you're mixing the philosophy like just like saying let's let's just think through this like step by step by step let's not necessarily try to tackle all the hard problems or the historicity of Jesus for mythicism or you know were the Romans involved how much was Josephus involved like you 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 deal with some of these you know hard issues but you you also are just taking people through this this question like like let's think through it does this make sense does this make sense and it's so important because so many Christians, I think, don't give themselves that freedom. And it, I've said this on, on other interviews, but it's, it's almost like as much as it on, on this side of the fence, it doesn't sound very brave. It just sounds like a normal, skeptical, questionable, questioning, rational thing to say. 
you know, does this make sense? Could, could all the animals really fit on the, the ark? You know, what about all the, you know, eating each other? You know, what did they eat when they got off the ark? But like those questions, when you're in it, it sounds almost, almost blasphemous to question God. And I just, I love that you, you do that. And it's, um, I appreciate it. And it's, it's, it's important. I'm, I'm probably not as focused on that yet as I need to be. I'm more focused on some projects about just, just the kind of what you did with your, with your, um, with your work. So f- with your book about just saying like, let's just get the information out there. Like you didn't really know where this came from. So whatever you do with this information, let's just start with square one. Here's where this, here's the history of it all. Here's the step-by-step story, do with it what you want. But you're, I love how you bring in the, the whole, you know, does this really make sense? And I, I, I hear you, it's, it's important. Do you, I'm just curious, do you ever engage Christians uh, personally in some of these conversations? Oh, sure, um, frequently. What is your typical there, di- di- there dynamic in response? You can, you can find a number of debates that I've been involved in um, online. Sometimes, uh, I think in most of the debates, I'm, I'm with some other folks. Um, and yeah, just, just to go back on a, on a point you made about Please. Noah's Ark and, and so on. Yeah, it's interesting when you're in the frame of mind that, you know, you're reading the word of God. Most, a lot of Christians read the Bible, but they, they don't read it critically. They read it devotionally. Yes. So if they find something that doesn't make sense, the, the immediate uh, response is, well, that's a problem for me to forget that's my problem that's not the not the problem of the uh, of the text and um, yes i do uh, so to go back to your question i do get involved in in debates um, in every kind of forum um, street corner debates I, I i i used to do more of that <clears throat> than i do now well of course even even before the pandemic um, that kind of becomes um, unrewarding. It's kind of it's kind of difficult to stay on topic. Yeah. Um, and Do you I, ever and feel I like that, that dynamic of like people are are often entering arguments only to solidify their position, not to actually listen to the other side? Yeah. Well, that's the other problem with sort of a street corner kind of debate is that when you're engaged in a debate. You're not really trying to persuade the other guy or gal. Um, you're trying to persuade the audience that's listening, yeah. because because the other the other person is thinking about his or her response is you know busy thinking about uh, his or her response. And I've been involved in a number of debates, kind of uh, online uh, and so forth. And and I, I prefer to have a debate, you know, where you kind of maybe sitting down and you have some slides and a flip chart because it's just too easy to, you know, and the other problem is that a lot of these debates are, are unfocused. Like one of my very first debates I participated in is, I think the topic was Christianity. <laughs> it wasn't like, it wasn't any more focused than that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're, you're kind of all over the place and you can, you can ask questions and then the other side can bring up new topics and uh, you kind of go in a big circle and maybe it's entertaining for the audience and hopefully some people got some things out of it, but yeah. um, not real. That's not real um, rewarding. It seems so, like uh, some of them too are about who's the flashiest or cleverest. And it, you know, it's, 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 it's the whole idea, similar to our politics, you know, who you, you may have someone that's absolutely the best politician in every level for the job, you know, the best person for the job. But if they're, you know, not as, as, you know, attractive looking and not as, as well as spoken, not as polished, there's just going to be a natural lessening of their chance of getting in. And it's, it's similar. I, I, I feel like I often prefer to just listen to people give a presentation, kind of like what you do with Zoroastrianism, than to have this back and forth and people kind of try to figure out who is, who is more clever. You know, cleverness doesn't, doesn't get you too far in these issues. Like you really need to just you need, it's, it's about equipping people with all the information, which I, I love that you, you just, that's, that's what you do over and over and over. You just give people so much information to chew on. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, I try to do that, but it is interesting how, um, I think I reached a certain point cause I was doing a, quite a bit of that. And I think I reached a certain point where, uh, I became less interested in 
some questions of you know biblical inerrancy and the uh, um, the validity of the manuscript chain. Those are all interesting topics, and there are many people who are more much more knowledgeable than I am. Um, and I kind of became more interested in some of the the philosophical questions for the for the reasons that you that you raised that this is not a game of um, verbal volleyball. You know, a lot of times with when you're talking about problems with the Bible, apparent contradictions, uh, a well-versed apologist is going to have a response to just about any anything you can you can find that's a problem in the Bible. And of course, there's an energy asymmetry here too, right? Because someone who's a Christian, uh, their whole identity is bound up in this. Whereas if you're not a Christian, how much energy you you're, you're, how much energy are you really going to put into studying the Bible? Yeah. Um, and so you know an apologist is going to have a response. It's going to have a it's going to have a response. It might not be a, a very good response, but there's going to be a response to just about anything you can bring up. And so I really started getting more interested in some of the underlying philosophical you know philosophical questions. We can talk about some of those down the road. Yeah. Well, could I ask, um, again, you, you do go over so much in your video, which I, hope, I really encourage people again, uh, sort of beat a dead horse, but I hope people will go watch it um, even before they watch the rest of this. But um, in the midst of, of a video like that, one of the, the dynamics that occurs, is it, it happened to me and I'm sure it happened to other people that have watched it, is that that kind of jaw dropping effect of, of you know, it, it, when you're a Christian, it, you kind of, you know that there's some issues and topics to be better versed on, to be more, you know, to learn to be more of a, of a you know, a kind of a, uh, of a lay apologist about, there's more books to be read, but there's kind of this underlying assumption that no matter where the conversation takes you, no matter what discussions and topics come up, you know that you know that you know that you know as a Christian that at the end of the day, God will be justified. He will be, uh, you know, the one that is, you know, true and everyone else is a liar in that sense. And, and, and yet, and that wall is so thick and it's so strong for Christians. It's like, it's like, a, just a, it's like a, you know, a fortress. And yet there are occasions such as for me watching videos like yours and, and others where all of a sudden on a dime, something changes and it, it breaks through and it gives, it gives you that jaw dropping effect as, as the recipient of like, wait a second that, <laughs> and all of a sudden you, you're entertaining an entirely even if it's just theoretical for you know two seconds you're entertaining the possibility that, that that this this may need to be a much bigger research project than you first thought because you either need to be like no that's wrong and, and it's not the way history worked or that's not what happened with christianity or if that is what how it happened you kind of put the pieces together quickly. Like this has ramifications, lots of them very quickly. And I just wanted to ask, have you, have you had those kind of conversations with people ever, or, or just the feedback from people even after the fact where you can tell the ships are falling finally that, that have never fallen before. And, and, and I guess maybe to, to the, 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 the crux of it, what are the, the main points that you see in, in, in what you've brought to the table that tend to do that? Cause there's a lot of subjects that I think, they're, they're, they're really interesting, but they're more like background information. But when you get to certain points, it's like, oh, okay, that's, that's the, we got a watershed here now. Um, what kind of points really drive this stuff home to people that open their eyes maybe for the first time? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a big, that's a big, that's a big question. question. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things I tried to do in my presentation was use the text of the Bible as often as I could. Um, yes. Because what I was trying to do was, was, was widen the lens that people were looking at, as you, as you say, but um, use sources that were less likely to be questioned by an audience that was clinging uh, to, those, to those beliefs. Yeah. And it's interesting how many people go to church regularly, but maybe they've never actually seen Leviticus 25 talking about slavery um, or, or uh, Numbers uh, is it 31 or 37, uh, which talks about taking the, taking the, web, the virgins as sex slaves. 
Um, so um, part of it is just sort of that, that jarring effect of saying, wait a minute, have you really looked at this? <laughs> have you really looked at what this book is saying? Yeah. Um, and of course, there are different kinds of believers. Um, people who are, are, are fundamentalists are more, clinging more closely to the, to the text of the Bible itself. Yeah. Um, you, you have to talk to them very differently from the way you talk to uh, uh, someone who's more sophisticated. Well, I shouldn't say progressive or <clears throat> liberal. Someone who's more sophisticated. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I almost started talking about the branches of Christianity. Remind me to come back to that. Sure. Um, but, you know, sort of this idea that, well, you know, the Bible's the word of God. Who are you going to believe? You're going to believe some man or you're going to believe God? And my response is to affect astonishment and to say, you mean to tell me you saw God write this book? <laughs> and, of course, they'll say no, and whereupon I can, I can say, oh, so some man told you. God wrote this book. And for some, you know, some people that that kind of shakes them up a little bit. Um, I did want to digress a little bit about, you know, kind of I talk in my book about the three, the three main branches of Christianity. Um, is you've got Roman Catholics, which are basically the majority or the, the, the biggest group, 51% um, of Christians globally. Although some fundamentalists will say Roman Catholics are not really Christians, which I find hilarious. Yeah. Um, we'll I would have said that. that, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, Eastern Orthodox uh, is the smallest of the three main branches, and then Protestants kind of in the middle. And I, I've come, as I've been getting more into these philosophical issues, I've come to respect the Roman Catholic Church and, East, and the Eastern Orthodox Church much more than I had originally. And I, I see Protestants as a group of folks who are essentially sawing off the limb that they're sitting on because, you know, the, the whole Bible, which is what they're basing, you know, that, that's the revelation of God, uh, uh, apparently. Uh, um, well, it didn't just come out of nowhere. It came out of the apostolic tradition the magisterium, church tradition. And so when the, when the Protestants threw all that out, it's kind of like an act of levitation. They've just got this book. And so that's when you get into all these really funny conversations about the book being self-authenticating. Yeah. So you have these self-referential arguments. Well, well, the book predicts that this is going to happen. And then later in the same book, it happens. You know, lo and behold. And um, you know, to me, one of, I see Mormonism, and, and I, this is something I, I write about in my book, I see Mormonism as the uh, reductio ad absurdum of Protestantism. But, you know, the point is, uh, Protestantism makes every man a pope. Uh, and so, you know, the, the Christians took the Jewish scriptures, they basically commandeered the Jewish scriptures, uh, the, and they call it the Old Testament, and then they put the New Testament. Well, then Mormons took the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they put the, the Book of Mormon there as a basically a third testament. Yeah. So there's this old joke about, well, why did God make why did God make Mormons so Christians would know how the Jews felt <laughs> about having their book appropriated? Yeah. So um you know, it just seems to me that the logical conclusion of Protestantism is Mormonism. Everybody uh kind of you know doing their own thing yeah um i've digressed um well can i just comment on what something you said a minute ago please, please yeah the, the moral the moral part of it i appreciate you you bringing that up um you know the the slavery uh you know the, all kinds of moral issues you know genocide stoning uh land theft kidnapping you know um the whole, you know, young virgins being saved for um, either sex slavery or child brides or, or worse, um, all these things, and, you know, added probably another dozen or so to it, but that was the very first start for me. Um, we were, mm. as, as you do as a Christian, you raise your kids to love the Lord, to be little, little soldiers for Jesus. 
and we're sitting here doing what we call Bible time, where we would sing some songs, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, and Jesus loves little children. And one of the songs that, I, I don't know if you've ever heard this song, but it's called Joshua Fought the Battle of Jericho. You know that mm. song? And we're sitting there, and of course the kids just love it. They're just, they just go out in the middle of the room and just spin, you know, like they're, yeah. they're dan- little dancers, and they're more interested in the dancing than the song. But um, spinning, spinning till they're, till they're dizzy. And as we're singing this song, I'm thinking, they don't know it because there's no verse that says it in the song, but in the, the verses in the Bible, the next part of that story is they go and slaughter people. And that was the very first thought. And, and that with, along with the, some, some questioning that brought me to people like Matt Dillahunty and other, other atheists who, who really attacked the moral issue really strongly. It's like, if you, if you are turning a blind eye to the Bible, you just don't read those passages or you just say, well, it's all about the New Testament, which I know some, some preachers are famous for these days. That's, that's one way to deal with it. But if you're going to be honest, and, and as you pointed out in your video, the Old Testament God is portrayed as the same as the New Testament. Jesus is, you know, uh, is God and they're, they're the same forever. And if that's true, then, then Jesus is the one that commanded the genocide. Jesus is the one that commanded slavery and stoning. You know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, commanded, you know, the young virgins to be saved after the parents and, and siblings were all slaughtered. And if you, if you're an honest Christian, you have to either, I mean, to me, you have to either ignore those to some extent, or you have to, to be willing to go to some pretty monstrous conclusions and say, yeah, God has the right to commit genocide. And yeah, if, if I was one of those people, I would have picked up a stone and stoned my own son. Like it says, if your son is, is disobedient and, and is, you know, won't obey you, take your son, your son to the village elders and, and you start the stoning and they help you kill him. I, if, you know, you, if you're willing to bend your knee to God, to Yahweh, then you have to, if you're going to follow through logically, you would say, if I was in that time frame under those rules, I would have stoned my own child for the, the sake of obedience to Yahweh. And it's, it's amazing when you take it, you start thinking through it, how horrible these things are. And that's, we're just touching the tip of the tip of the iceberg here. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting question. And it's interesting that you picked up on that because I, ex- I expect based on what you said that you recall in my, in my presentation that very early on, I paused to remind the audience that the God of the old Testament and the God of the new Testament is the same God. Yeah. Um, for, for just that reason, I, I didn't want people having that, you know, discrepancy in their mind. And of course, when you think about it, none of the Christology, none of the, 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 the soteriology, the, uh, the aspect of uh, salvation, none of that makes sense in the New Testament without the Old Testament, because the Old Testament is where you had the creation and the fall, and you had Adam and Eve. And if you didn't have the fall, you wouldn't have the need for the redemption. And so, you know, just focusing on the New Testament by itself, um, it just seems to me to be a fool's errand. Yeah. Could, could I play off of that to, to take you to another question? One of the things that's it's fascinating to me is, is how you bring up the story of, of the Yahweh character, the El, El character, Yahweh, uh, Asherah, Baal, and all that. And just the idea that a lot of us, and myself included, we, we, we focus a lot, and rightfully so, on, on the, 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 you know, the, the turn of, you know, uh, when, G, when Jesus was born, or if there was a Jesus, you know, whether or there was or not, uh, whoever it was that they were talking about, that time frame, you know, what was happening, you know, with the Second Temple Judaism, what was happening with the Book of Enoch, and all the different, you know, what was happening with the Essenes and Qumran, um, Josephus, all these things, but to me, it's, it's like, it, it, if it's stacked up like his dominoes, if you go back far enough, because, again, like you said, Jesus is portrayed as the same. He's the son, but he's also the same. He is God. Um, and that's flushed, flushed out very clearly in, in the rest of the New Testament in the epistles. Uh, I am the father of one, but, you know, with, uh, and Paul talks about how, you know, God made everything through Christ. But if, if you were to go back before that, you know, way before Christ, and you just take it back to the Old Testament, just go back to the very beginning, it's, it's kind of like an implication that if you, can, if you can deconstruct the Yahweh character, everything else falls. I mean, you, you can't really say, well, the Yahweh character was completely made up. He was completely mythological. Um, he was completely a, a copy, plagiarized, you know, deity of, you know, of pre-existing Canaanite deities. And then say, but Jesus is real. 
and he's also the same God as Yahweh. It's like, it doesn't work. And could you, mm. for, for anyone that doesn't know about it, about the polytheism and the, the henotheism, the monotheism, could you just give a brief synopsis? Again, you, you, you do it perfectly in your video, so I don't want to uh, distract people from that, but just for the sake of people listening today, could you tell us what happened there with, with the Yahweh character? Sure. Um, and by the way, I, I, I'm not sure if you've, if you've seen this, but on my website, seeingthroughchristianity.com, I have a, a blog or an essay that's about polytheism in the Old Testament, and it goes into some more detail hmm. than in my presentation. So I thought you in particular would appreciate that or enjoy that, because I, I talk about some more of those passages with the heavenly court or the divine yeah. the divine council and, and so on. I'll make sure that that link is too beneath our video if anyone wants to oh, read that as yeah, well. That, that's a great idea. I mean, briefly, um, it's very clear from um, archaeological finds in the last hundred years uh, from things called the Ugaritic texts and so on that the inhabitants of ancient Canaan were polytheists and they had a, uh, a pantheon with, uh, with El as the male and Asherah as the female principle uh, at the top. And um, there, there are a number of uh, places in the, in the biblical record where um, the allegedly monotheistic God is referred to as El or Elohim, which is the plural uh, of El, in addition to Yahweh. Um, and there are a couple of other um, references that, that incorporate El. And mm -hmm. what happens is at a certain point in the story, um, Yahweh uh, comes into the mix and Yahweh may well have been uh, imported, uh, an imported God that came in um, from another, uh, another geographic area and may have been championed by a charismatic chieftain, perhaps somebody that Moses might have been modeled on, you know, in a sort of a composite King Arthur type, type way. Um, and over time, um, Yahweh and El, their identities uh, were fused and then their biographies were combined. And one of the strongest pieces of evidence for that I talk about in the video uh, is that uh, while the Old Testament is full of uh, polemics against Baal or Baal, uh, there are no polemics against El at all. Hmm. Which And El would have been the logical target being the, uh, the head of the, the competitive pantheon. And so, and so uh, my thesis, and I provide a number of uh, of, of pieces of support for this is that El and Yahweh were ba basically fused and that those references to El uh, in, the, in the oldest strata of the Old Testament writings are really uh, footprints of an earlier belief system that was then later massaged and camouflaged, if you will, into just another way of talking about Yahweh. And that, you know, really the, the Jews, leaving aside perhaps a few uh, intellectuals, the, 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 the majority of Jewish belief was polytheistic up until the time of the Babylonian captivity, hmm. when you had the writings of Second Isaiah and exposure to uh, Persian influence. So that kind of is a, is a sort of a key inflection point for me. And it seems like th that point is just, it can't be emphasized enough, not just the, the, the actual history of it that you're saying, but the bigger picture for Christians is you haven't been told this before. Like you're, you're not being, you're being, and it's not like it's not there. It's, there's plenty of books, um, you know, that, that you can, you know, pick up, you know, websites, videos that explain it and talk through it. But for most Christians, they're not told that. And it, it feels like part of my frustration and angst in, in, in anticipating maybe questions or, or, or conversations with Christians on these topics is the whole fact that when you get someone so just in, in rapture and, 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 and invested in this party line, everything else sounds so strange that when you tell the truth, it sounds like fiction. It sounds like you're making it up. Like, for example, I'm working on a project that'll... Um, take a while and have several iterations, 
but uh, some, another gentleman uh, that I, I've listened to a lot, his name is Jason Folks, and his, his YouTube channel is Dragons in Genesis. He pointed out in one of his videos that the book of Enoch is quoted in the New Testament dozens of times, not just in the, where it's explicitly mentioned in Jude, but over and over it's quoted and you don't even know it's happening. And I took it upon myself to look those up and, you know, verify it. And, and it's there, but there's a lot more, you know, that, that we can think of, like Book of Jubilees is quoted, Maccabees is quoted, uh, you know, the, the, the Qumran books, you know, community books are quoted, um, you know, uh, Janice McDonald, which we were talking about before we started the recording, he talks about how um, they were they were copying from uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey as they made Luke and Act, and you can clearly see the parallels. Um, they're copying from Virgil and, and, and Euripides and lots of other things like that. And it's just, it's, if you tell a Christian that, hey, did you know your book has dozens and dozens and dozens of quotes from Enoch? They'd be like, no, I don't. And, but, but it's like, it, it, they get so used to the party line. And I, I, I don't want to belabor this point, but it feels like it's one of the hardest issues to break through is the truth becomes stranger than fiction to them. And it's, it's ironic, but it's an, it's an issue we have to honestly deal with is the, the, this, it's, it's something we see even in politics today is this issue of the party line gets to decide yeah. which information you get and also how you interpret the information you get. And it, it, there is this issue that, um, you know, fake news, as much as it seems like it's a new concept in, in our vocabulary, it's been going on for thousands of years. And the people in power get to decide what you hear and what you don't hear. And even when the information is readily available in the internet age, you still don't hear it as Christians. And I just, I find it interesting how much is available and yet we don't no one's talking about it yeah um yeah great points um and regarding enoch uh, and some of those other books I, I refer to them as the intertestamental writings um i talk about them since i'm going to shamelessly plug my book. please yeah um seeing through christianity i talk about in in the book is that um you know there's all sorts of uncertainty about the manuscript chain, uh, the integrity of the manuscript chain in the, in the New Testament. And I talk about the very human process by which certain books were chosen for inclusion in the New Testament and other books were chosen for exclusion in the New Testament. And that comes as a surprise to some people. But what comes as an even bigger surprise to many people, I find, is that the three main branches of Christianity have different Old Testaments. Yes. So um, let's see, where do I have that in here? I've got a list. Oh, yeah, I've got a list of the different canons. I think if I'm not mistaken, the Ethiopian church has never yeah. lost Enoch. They've had it forever. Yeah, so the, the, actual, the actual Jewish Bible is, is very close to what Protestants accept. Mm -hmm. But the Catholic and East, Eastern Orthodox Church have many more. I've got a side-by-side -side listing here. I, I know you can't read it. Um, many more uh, of these books. And I like to point that out because this thing, it's so obviously a human product. It has human fingerprints uh, all over it. Yeah. And, you know, showing that continuity between the Old Testament and New Testament I think is really just part of telling that story that this is the result of a very understandable historical process. You know, human beings have always been puzzled and we've always been trying to figure things out. It's just, that's in our nature. And uh, as the species has matured, hopefully we've just gotten a little bit better at it. Although recent political events would call that into question. Yeah. Could, um, could I ask, I, I know we, um... We want to get to a couple of the questions too, but just to wrap up the, the part about the Old Testament. Um, you mentioned a couple of times in your video, the whole idea of it, there's a lot of confusion that's, that's in the store of the Old Testament. And it's, it's obvious looking back at it now, you know, there's, there's multiple voices talking into it, you know, people, you know, different with different political, religious uh, uh, backgrounds and, and, and drives as to why they want the story to go one way or the other. But um, the name of God becomes an issue in the sense of, you know, why would you want in a, in a polytheistic culture, if, if this were real, if, they had been, if it was the way the Christians describe it, why would you want um, 
a God that's unclear and a, a parallel. I, I, I don't think you mentioned this per se in your video. It may be in your book, but another parallel that comes to mind quickly is the whole Abraham story. You know, if, if all the other people around you are sacrificing their children, then wouldn't when God says you know, to Abraham, hey, go sacrifice your kid, too. If you want to be different from them all, wouldn't the right answer be? no, I'm not going to sacrifice my kid because we want to make the point we're not like them as opposed to saying, oh, sure, I'll, I'll do what all the other pagan gods or guys are doing to their kids. Sure. Like, could you speak yeah, to that? Just the point. rationality of, of the, and the confusion issue that it's really woven into the, the literal, you know, interpretation of the Old Testament. Yeah, um, that's a great point. It's funny you bring up the Abraham story. I just read Kierkegaard's book, uh, Fear and Trembling. Hmm. Now, Kierkegaard, you know, writing in the 1840s, a brilliant Danish uh, thinker from a Lutheran background, and he's trying to understand the whole Abraham story. And um, he basically, you know, comes to this view that you do, you just have to be resigned to it, and then if you if you if you come through resignation, that faith will be kind of the prize that you get on the other side of it. And I, I'm not sure I completely understood what Kierkegaard was saying, but um, it just goes to show you, it, even somebody that smart, you know, in many ways, the smarter you are, the cleverer, the excuses you're going to make for what you already believe. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Lewis is a, another great example of that. Very, it, very it, smart. Thank you. It, it shows the, it shows the power of, worldview and what it is that you're accepting as axiomatic perhaps without even being aware that you're doing so yeah yeah you can truly be in one sense absolutely brilliant beyond brilliant and still be stuck in the stuff um that honestly i feel very very glad uh because i'm not some brilliant phd guy i'm just a just a bible college grad that studied but it's like you're like i i honestly sometimes kind of metaphorically tremble thinking what if i never got out like what if i spent my whole life thinking this was real it's 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 amazing um could i ask uh, just moving on i i want to ask about your perspectives on the the actual new testament side of this and again I'm, I'm going through some stuff quickly for the sake of time but i would love to hear your take on what you think happened in terms of the jesus character and what i mean by that is, is just a little context there are a lot of people who question, and I, I think rightfully so, um, and I, I respect them a lot, whether there really was a Jesus character. Not to say that there weren't clearly messianic, apocalyptic preachers in, 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 in Judea and the Galilee. We know they were there. We know there are dozens of them. We know there are people that were willing to fight against Rome, willing to you know, create uh, you know, followings, to baptize people. Lots of people did it in that time frame, and that's been well documented. But the idea of was there an actual... Jesus, um, do you have any kind of sense? Uh, I know you, you know, we don't have a, uh, a bone in the fight. If, you know, who, who really cares at the end of the day? It's all mythologized by now. But do you think there was a guy at the beginning? And if, if, you, if you do think there was, um, could you just maybe explain why you would think that that's more likely? Or if there, there, if there wasn't, I'd love to hear your thought on, on the different mythicist positions that have been put forward, um, such as the idea that he was, uh, you know, an archangel crucified in the heavens. Um, and there's a lot of other, other uh, ideas that have been put out there. What do you think happened, you know, between, you know, 50 BC and, and 50 uh, AD? Uh, what, what happened there? Yeah, well, um, I don't, I don't claim to know the answer, but I, I, yeah, so among non-believers, you know, you have this schism <laughs> uh, between the mythicists and those who believe in uh, historical uh, Jesus. And I've never been particularly bothered uh, by the question because to me, it's almost a spectrum. Um, even if you have a historical Jesus, there have been so many legends and stories uh, told about them that it's kind of indistinguishable from mythicism. So, you know, and as, as you say, there's there's plenty of good scholarship talking about the, the many uh, would-be messiahs who had fanatical anti, anti-Rome uh, sentiments at that time and in Palestine. 
Um, so, yeah, I never got too exercised about the question. I know Richard Carrier, who I always enjoy, um, is, a, is, a, is a great mythicist. Um, in my book, I take the historical uh, position. So I say, I say that, um, that there was a charismatic rabbi who gathered a following, uh, made powerful enemies, and was executed. And that pretty much the rest of it um, was legendary, and that it could have been, it could have been sparked by uh, extreme uh, bereavement. That these, these, uh, these uh, uh, dreams or, or visions uh, or just uh, sense of presence. These things have been uh, documented in the psychological literature in case of, of extreme bereavement. Um, all of those forces are at work in a in a pre-scientific. Uh, illiterate culture, and um, you know, plus you had this widespread belief in an imminent apocalypse, the appearance of a messiah. I make the point in my book that, you know, um, if there hadn't been a rumor of Jesus's resurrection, there almost certainly would have been a rumor of someone else's resurrection because the the culture wanted it, the culture yeah. was ready for it. Um, and I, I talk a little bit about. Well, where the resurrection, the whole this whole idea of a resurrection might have come from in my in in the video that, that you're referring to, and I I point the finger at Zoroastrianism uh, and this idea that that Old Testament Judaism did not have a differentiated afterlife. It didn't have a heaven and a hell. It just had one place, Sheol, uh, and it didn't have Satan as a as an opponent of God. It had as a sort of an underling of God, um, and yet at the same time. You know, the, the, the Hellenistic world was replete with miraculous godmen uh, and women, uh, goddess, goddesses, who were, who were doing, or who had suspiciously similar stories told about them. I don't, I don't think the Christ, I don't think the Christian story derived from those Hellenistic influences, but I do think those Hellenistic influences, which had permeated the Gentile culture into which Paul was preaching, I think those those beliefs shaped the way the Jesus story was heard. Yeah. In fact, I've got a, it's a fun topic, you know, and I talk a little bit in the, in the video about uh, mystery religions, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I talk some more about it in my book. I made this slide, um, which I've never shown anyone because I just never got around to it, and I don't know if you can see it, um, but I've got, uh, whoops, I've got, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, cat. I, this is a Venn diagram, for those of you who remember your eighth grade math. So I've got, you know, major mystery religions, dying and rising gods, and apotheosized god men. And you can see that, you know, there were lots of gods that had various similarities to the Jesus story. Hmm. Um, but none of them were exactly the same as the Jesus story. You know, but so what? None of them were exactly the same as each other. They were all unique. Yeah. And that's always kind of funny because you hear apologists say, well, Jesus was unique. Well, actually, you know, all religions are unique. <laughs> but um, it's a fascinating question. This whole issue of the mystery religions, we don't know as much about them as, as, as we would like to. Um, but it just, it just tells you the mindset into which uh, the stories were being told. And even some of the initiation was was similar too, right? Not just the, the the demigod or the god figure, but even just how you get into the to the group. Um, for example, if I'm not mistaken, some of them had a, a some kind of version of a baptism, uh, baptismal uh, initiation, and some kind of communal meal uh, where you partake of, of you know bread and wine or bread and beer, and you become part of the supposed you know family with the fictive kinship, and it just. Yeah. It, yeah, it's 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 a hard we, sell to say it's an exit like a copycat, like a completely plagiarized way to switch names. But the the milieu in which it occurred, it's it's very obvious. This is probably fair to say is it's a Jewish mystery cult. And, and right, and you could you could go that far, and I and I know Richard Carrier has. I'm you know I'm not sure whether that's entirely fair, but boy, uh, you could sure make the case. Yeah. Um. And and um. We had talked earlier on about. 
you know, sort of my, my book and the presentation that we've been talking about kind of leave off at the formation of the early church and or what you might call primitive Christianity. Uh, before I forget, I did want to plug one book, sure. um, which is um, Bart Ehrman. Um, oops. His How book, Jesus Became How God. Jesus Became God. So he does a really good, I mean, I'm a, I like Bart Ehrman quite a bit. And he's a, a serious scholar uh, who's really over, guess, over the past decade has turned more to popularization. Uh, but he does a really good job of talking about how the early church took shape and how some of these doctrines like the Trinity and so on got hammered out. Yeah. So it's, it's a good next step um, for anybody who's interested in, in that like sort of thing. That's a great point too. Is that th this this did get hammered out in the sense that there were there were very powerful and, and even vindictive and even physically violent people fighting and, and fighting back and forth. People with power and, and reasons to have their their party line win over someone else's party line. And the idea that there were many Christianities at the beginning. There were there was not just one single version. And you know, so to, to say, well, you know, Marcion was the the oddball and all the real Christians, you know, were against him. It's like no, that there were there were different people with different views of this, and there were there were parties that got their voices stronger and stronger, and eventually won the day. And that that kept that happened in several big iterations. Uh, but there was a lot of people with a lot of different ideas, and uh, I, I find it fascinating too that just the question of who. I mean, I, I'm kind of probably oversimplifying this question, but like, who did this in the beginning? Like, who came up with this story, whether there was a guy and they just kind of added, made up stories to it, or there was never a guy and they just kind of made the whole thing up. But like, who was behind it? Because you mentioned it, you know, the people in that, in that era and that place would have spoken Aramaic, and yet it was written in Greek. And so you have this really weird mixture of, of people that are clearly well-versed in the Old Testament. They know all about blood sacrifice, uh, scapegoating, mm -hmm. you know, the spotless lamb. They're, they're clearly copying from the Homeric epics from other Greek philosophers. They're, they're clearly bringing in Neoplatonism. Uh, they're bringing in a lot of astrotheology. I was just interviewing Bill Darlison, who talked about how the Zodiac is, is all through the Gospel of Mark in the right order. Uh, through the stories, you know, they're weaving in, in you know, some Pythagoreanism, then you have some Gamatria, and it's like this, and there's a lot of other stuff I'm leaving off, but it's like this, it's, in a sense, if you take it literally, yeah, it's, it's a really bad worldview, but if you're out of it and you're just saying, I just want to look at it as a historical, archaeological, from, from that perspective, it's really fascinating what they did to make this story up. And I was curious if you have any best guesses, I know this is nothing that people can be dogmatic about, but you know, in light of knowing that there was uh, that, you know, a big library in Alexandria, in light of knowing that, you know, potentially Rome may have had a vested interest in a pacifist, you know, Jewish community, potentially, um, if some of some have brought up, the, you know, the, the Romans may have wanted to, wanted to you know, pass, get, get a Jesus who was willing to say, pay, to, you know, to Rome what's Rome's and just give to God what's God's. Um, and, and to have Paul say, obey the, the rulers that are put there by God. A lot of different ideas as to who might have done this. Um, What's your best guess from what you've studied so far as to who who actually put this thing down the way we have it and what they were trying to accomplish? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I mean, as, as general background, uh, I'm not big on conspiracies. Mm -hmm. I come from the I, I come from the, the shit happens school of history. Um, I don't I like that. Most people. Certainly, me. Most people are not clever enough to to uh, to hatch a conspiracy. And if you have more than two people, and if you have more than one person involved, it's difficult to keep things a secret. So, um, sure. I, I I tend to to view this as just a story that developed over time. And um, I you can find political motives, but I don't think you need to read them into the record, given given the historical context and given humans, you know, natural desire for answers. I yeah. mean, somebody comes along, um, somebody comes along with a, an earnest story. So, you know, back in the day when information was transmitted largely orally, don't forget literacy is a pretty recent phenomenon. Uh, you know, the, the printing press was only 500 years old. Um, 
people would judge veracity based on the sincerity of the speaker. So you get somebody like Paul, and, and I know you've read your, your New Testament. Paul, Paul really comes through. As, he was probably a force to be reckoned with yeah. uh, in, in person. So, you know, given the background um, of the culture and um, people's desire to have answers for difficult questions and the attractiveness of the belief system, you know, you can kind of almost look at this in a Darwinian sense that here's a here's a belief system that took ethical monotheism which is uh you could argue even though the jews weren't the first monotheists uh, some of the egyptians were you could argue that they invented ethical monotheism this idea that god cares about what you're doing not just that there's only one god and and there's a lot of attractiveness to that there's some comfort to that you combine that with the idea that, hey, you don't have to chop off the tip of your penis to join, so you don't have to be a Jew, with an ins not only permission, but a, an encouragement to proselytize. Um, and this idea that it's open to everybody, women and slaves, and then wrap all of that together with a bow that says there's a cure for death. Now, that's a very attractive package. So, um, you know, as far as cultural evolution goes, I don't really see any great, you know, mystery. Yeah. Um, there are historians who talk about the fact that if Rome hadn't become Christian, it would have been Mithraist. That myth Mithraism was, you know, the, the kind of the competing, maybe, that, that might be stretching it a little bit, but there were, Mithraism was certainly uh, prevalent. So was Judaism, incidentally. Uh, a lot of Romans found Jewish moral conduct commendable. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very complicated picture. I don't think, I don't think you can point to any cabal, that kind of, and you know, an argument against the conspiracy is that precisely because it did take multiple centuries to develop, no one person or group of people could have shepherded a conspiracy uh, to form over that long a period. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. I was curious, the last question about mystery cults, um, you mentioned those. Um, the whole concept of, of mystery cult is, is we have a mystery and unless you're initiated, you, you know, you can't have it. But once you're initiated, we will tell you these deep secrets of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, in, in a context as well of, of uh, you know, with the Jewish mystery cult concept of, of these they were people that were apocalyptic and a lot of them were wrapping that up in these stories with these visions, the Enochian visions of going up to the levels of heaven, uh, you know, the whole uh, Merkava literature, all these people having visions and chariots and, and, and heavens and archangels and Metatron and just a lot of really cool stuff to you know, when you realize what was going on. But this real strong sense of like, this is a secret. And unless you're in the club, you're not really going to understand it. But this sense of we'll give you the the the, the kind of the, the real easy versions so like jesus talks about you know to the to the crowds they're going to get it in parables but to you i'm going to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom um do you do you find much credence in the idea that some of the originators of christianity may have been looking at this in a much more esoteric sense where uh they were looking at at this in a in a sense as we we can't you know, people aren't going to be philosophers, as you said earlier, so they can't think through all the deep mysteries of, of, of existence and of, of, of God and of the Neoplatonic stuff that, you know, that could get very deep very quickly for people that are just, you know, working on their farms. But if you give people a, just a basic story, hey, there was a guy, hey, he preached awesome things, hey, he could heal the, you know, heal blindness, he was actually God, he could take on your sins, he died, rose again, and he's going to come back for you again someday. It's a pretty easy story to follow, especially if you already used to these a lot of these concepts like blood magic where you you do see them sacrificing sheep and goats to other gods like okay yeah i get it blood does mean a lot do you think that there's any possibility that they were creating i know this is all conjecture but i'm just curious to pick your brain on this stuff that, that they were creating this with the sense that the initiates early on knew that this wasn't real they they knew 
the, for example, that, I mean, someone knew that they were basing Mark on the Zodiac. So, you know, somebody did obviously because they wrote it that way, but that they would say, you know what, if, if for the people that, that are really one of us, we'll walk them through and we'll tell them how this is a star story. But for the rest of the people, you know, tell them, you know, that Jesus said, go look for a guy who's got a big water pitcher. Don't tell them it's Aquarius. Just tell them it's a water pitcher and let them think it. that's what's happening, you know, um, yeah. or whatever, or make, you know, the, all the other, you know, star stories that are woven in. Do you think they were trying to kind of not trick people necessarily, but kind of say, let's, let's keep this at two levels. Yeah. Um, that's a real possibility. Um, you mentioned, you know, how easy the story is to tell. And, um, some of my some of my buddies and I we, we kind of we talk about the mono sermon. To me, it's astonishing that preachers can get up every Sunday and talk because there's only really one sermon. <laughs> Everything else is just window dressing. Um, yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, the multiple Christianities, and of course, there were a lot of losers in you know the jostling for what christianity meant and the winners are the ones who get to write the history so they're the ones that get to designate themselves as orthodox meaning meaning right belief and the others as uh, heretical and um there were there were various sort of gnostic beliefs and you know gnosticism in a different sense from agnosticism this is the first century sense of Gnosticism is about secret knowledge and about secret knowledge that you have to possess in order to be saved. Um, yeah, and it's been a while since I've looked into this, but um, there seems to be a lot of evidence, in, and, and you, like you say, there's, ex, there's passages in the Gospels that certainly hint to um, a two-track uh, belief system where, you know, the initiates, the initiates have knowledge that the rest of the folks don't have. It's difficult to put to push it without getting really speculative. It's difficult to push it much farther than that. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you come upon some really good um, discussions of that, I'd be interested in in hearing that. But I know there, you know, there were there were various Gnostic gospels that got chucked out. Um, the Gospel of Thomas, I believe, is very much. Uh, Gnostic because it's just full of um, aphorisms and it it actually starts out with you know with one of the first one of the first things it says is whoever reads these these truths will you know have the secret some something that I'm not I'm not getting the quote exactly right um, so yeah the Gospel of Thomas is, is would definitely be a, on on your reading list if that's something you're you know interested in looking into. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to um, ask one more question about this and then move on to um, uh, two final topics. Um, if we can squeeze them in, uh, I wanted to get to presuppositionalism and the transcendental argument for God. But one final question on this on this uh, arena. Paul, uh, obviously a major player in this. He doesn't do a, do a lot of things or say a lot of things that you'd expect him to say. Um, he, 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 you'd think if he was, you know, if he'd really seen this vision on the road to Damascus and he finally gets a chance to go be with the, the you know, the, 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 the disciples, the real apostles that actually walked and talked with Jesus and ate with him and, you know, got to do everything with him, that he would just be like, Hey, tell me what else, you know, Jesus spoke to me for 10 minutes on the road, but I know he, he spoke, spent, you know, years with you, whatever. What else did he say that I don't know about? But instead he kind of says like, I ignored those guys for the most part. And, you know, I went when I had to, but otherwise I was kind of doing my own thing. And he doesn't quote the parables, which you're like, your, your Lord and master and great rabbi, he talks in parables all the time and you don't ever talk about it. Uh, he doesn't talk about so many parts of Jesus' story. Um, what do you think Paul thought of Jesus? Do you, do you get the sense that he thought that Jesus was a historical figure most likely? And as opposed to just a, 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 a you know, someone that was spiritual, um, you know, maybe up in heaven or one of the heavens. Yeah. What do you Great. think his role was in this? Great question, because Paul wrote before the Gospels were written. Right. And so the fact that he says so little about the biographical Jesus um, is certainly suggestive of the fact that the Gospels were uh, confected. 
uh, years after uh, the events that may have that they may have been based on, that a lot of time had passed, and that even in the 50s when Paul was writing, there was very little biographical material uh, to go on. Yeah, um, you know, in my book again, I take the, the position that Paul refers to uh, to James as the brother of Jesus, uh, and 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 I, may, I that's probably one of the strongest arguments that Jesus was a historical figure. On the other hand, as, as you point out, Paul certainly says some things that make it sound like Jesus was some sort of an archangel. He had this very strange Christology where, where it, in some passages, it seems like Jesus was coming down from the heavens to sojourn with us for a little while. Yeah, and then, and then crucified and then become, by the archons of this age. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so um, Paul is very, it's very difficult to understand. I think you can... You know, this is kind of like looking for proof texts. I think you can argue on both sides of, of the issue when you dig into Paul. Yeah. But, sure. he's, but he's fun to read. And I make the point in my book that he had three sources, personal revelation, um, an oral tradition that he was in receipt of, and then most, ironically, most importantly, scriptural reinterpretation. Because... Yeah as I pointed out in my video, he went all the way back to Genesis and said, you guys had the story all wrong. I'm going to tell you what this is really about. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating to, to try to piece together how, how they did it. And, uh, it's, it's an amazing story on a lot of levels. It's also, just thinking about how, you know, uh, Bart Ehrman has pointed out that there's, um, you know, there's a lot of scholars who, who believe that Paul didn't write all those books. There's just, there's so much forgery and counterforgery going on you know, that even the Paul that we think of may have been someone else. And so it was different people. <clears throat> it's, it's weird to me when you look at, for example, like first Corinthians, I think it is where it looks like even in the same passage, it might be two people or more arguing where on the one, mm -hmm. in the one passage, he says, uh, you know, if you want to sac eat meat, sacrifice idols, who cares? There's, there's no idols, nothing. There's no real God. So do it. And then he says, but we don't want to have anything to do with the works of the devil. So don't do it. And it's like, you know, what, what which way is it, you know, and, and women need to be silent in the churches. And, and, and uh, I think this Timothy, you know, they need to be silent in churches and ask their husbands at home. And yet he's, you know, he's got women working with him in the ministry and deaconesses. And it's interesting to see almost, you almost see people arguing within the, within the text itself of, of the scripture. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as you say, we know there's been interpolations into the text and, in my book, I talk about that one particular passage where he says oh, women must be silent and a, a woman can't have authority over a man. That That's almost certainly somebody added that later, precisely yeah. for the reason that you mentioned that Paul was working with uh, um, very closely with a number of women who he, whose praises he sings. Yeah. It seems like there's a number of times you could look at the Bible and this is just, you know, backwards and trying to interpret it, but a number of times where it, it definitely takes on a, a balanced perspective and then it turns to the patriarchy and the misogyny. Like you mentioned mm -hmm. Yahweh, but he had a wife named Asherah. And it's like, at, so, at one point, women were very important and somehow it switches to, we don't even want to acknowledge her existence. This is all about Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So let's take the, the powerful, you know, woman God or woman demigod out of the equation. And again, you know, women are, are involved in the churches, you know, Mary Magdalene, these women that are so important. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, women, stop talking in church. Just if you have a question, save it till you get home and talk to your husband. It's, it's very disconcerting to see it, but it's also just as a kind of a, you know, a commentary. It's amazing to me to think that how many women, well-educated women of our, of our generation can look at this book and see how it just, just repeatedly degrades women and and you know a lot of other passages you know you know the dads can sell their, their young girls as a slave um if, if a girl uh is raped in certain contexts all the guy has to do is pay 30 shekels of silver or something and he gets to keep her uh forever and she can never leave him so many ways in which it's degrading to women and yet they support it and again leaving the whole origins of christianity thing to commentary but it it, it never ceases to amaze me that mm. i could see men yeah, I could understand men with their, you know, machoism or their patriarchy intentions to say, yeah, 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 that's good job, Paul. 
uh, but to see women saying, this is okay, I, I absolutely support this. It's, it never ceases to amaze me. Yeah. Um, a couple of interesting points there. Um, sometimes people say, well, it seems to me that women are more religious than men, which is kind of interesting on the one level, as you point out, so many religions, certainly in the Abrahamic family, are uh, misogynistic. Um, and yet there's this idea that, um, a theory that I think is plausible is this idea that because women in general are physically weaker, they, they want their society, and particularly the men in their society, and meshed in a rule-based system that controls their behavior and that reduces their discretion for physical violence. Mm. And so there's this almost this sort of evolutionary impulse for women to want to have, you know, a belief system uh, with an imprimator that's otherworldly uh, as a means of protecting themselves. Mm. Of course, the irony to that is or the, you know, the, the ironic part of that then is that that very system then can turn around and oppress them. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting that, it, you know, we now have a new Supreme Court justice who's a woman who's uh, apparently a devout Roman Catholic and apparently um, was or perhaps still is a member of a group of Roman Catholic women called something like the handmaids of God or the handmaids of Christ or the handmaids of the church or something like that. I mean, wow. And, and apparently, you know, some of the ideas here are that, you know, they're, they're, they are to be obedient to their husband, just as the husband is to be obedient to Christ. Hmm. Um, so, but again, this woman is probably brilliant and if she were joining us here on our recording, she would probably have five reasons why, which you know, her way of looking at things is perfectly appropriate. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's it's, uh, you know, all you can do is um, share your way of looking at things and hope the paradigm shifts. Yeah, yeah, it's <clears throat> I agree, and it, it sometimes it does feel like it's just small steps, and that's all you can do is, you know, it, it's kind of like that whole. Um, uh, illustration that's been probably overused, but you know, if you look at a beach full of um, starfish that are, you know, washed up on the beach, and they're all going to dry out in the sun and die, you know, and you see somebody throwing a few in, and you're like, you know, what's the big difference? There's thousands of them here. You can't get to them all. It's like, yeah, but to that one, it made a difference. Yeah. And it's like, you know, yeah. like, you know, your video, you know, how many people has your video affected compared to the realm of Christianity? But to me, it made a difference. You know, to me, it transformed my, my world. Um, Why? Well, I did want to make sure I left some time for um, two topics that are kind of uh, big on your heart. Mm -hmm. I will admit I am not as 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 well versed in these last two as as I am on the rest of what we've talked about. So I'm just going to ask you to kind of tell us what you've been thinking about these, and I will sit back and kind of probably just uh, get get an education here. But could you um, talk us through whatever uh, you've been you know kind of thinking through about presuppositionalism, and if time allows, uh, the transcendental argument for God. Well, the good news is that they're the same. They're the same thing. Okay. Um, and and I mentioned earlier that I've gotten more interested in some of the philosophical questions. And you know, the more you get into philosophy, the the more you realize how little you really know, because you're constantly asking very basic questions like, "Well, what do I mean by that?" You know? um, hmm. And 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 what presuppositionalism and the, the transcendental argument for God are. Um, it's really about weaponizing age-old problems in epistemology. So epistemology is, you know, the, the philosophy of what do we know and how do we know it? And, you know, there are some, there are old problems in epistemology that have never been solved, you know, like the old, how do we know there's a world outside of our minds? Yeah. So, so the, the fancy the word for that is solipsism. Yeah. And, and popular versions are like, you know, the, the brain and the vat or the matrix. Uh, of course, true solipsism is a little bit purer than that because even 
even the matrix and the vat, there's real physical world outside of the, the consciousness that's experiencing it. Whereas in, in solipsism, you know, you know, that for all you know, there's there's literally nothing else. There's there's only minds. Hmm. Um and so, you know, hey, hey, Mr. Non Believer, how do you how do you account for that? You know, you're 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 questioning our beliefs. But you you know you believe in this thing called science, and you know all the science is based on assuming that there's a real world out there. Science is based on things like the assumption that nature behaves consistently, the to the uniformity of nature. Where do you get? That's a philosophical assumption, right? You can't prove it. You can say, well, you know, the sun rose, the sun has risen every day in the past, so it's going to rise in the future. Um, but that's that's an argument that assumes the future is going to resemble the past. You know, you can't. Um, so there's all sorts of, you know, tricky issues like that. And so presuppositionalism is about a theist, and most often it's Christians, um, basically trying to turn those questions back on the unbeliever to say, hey, we have a solution for those questions, you know. Only if there's a God can we know or have confidence that there's an external world and that the laws of physics are going to be the same tomorrow as they are today. So we can have a coherent worldview. We can answer those questions. And you, Mr. Nonbeliever, you, you have an incoherent worldview. You're just assuming these things. You're just taking it on faith. <laughs> um, in fact, if you look at sort of, you know, the tradition, the philosophical tradition, you know, within epistemology, knowledge is traditionally defined as justified true belief. So it needs to be, it's a belief and it has to be true and you have to have a justification for it. Well, hey, you, Mr. You, Mr. Atheist, you don't have a foundation for your beliefs in an external world or the uniformity of nature. If you don't have justification, you don't have knowledge because knowledge is justified true belief. So Mr. Nonbeliever or Mrs. Nonbeliever, you literally know nothing. All you can do is shut up. <laughs> so it's an interesting um, apologetical approach. And it was kind of developed, I mean, it's kind of always been around a little bit, but it was really developed by a, um, a Calvinist guy in the mid, mid 20th century named Cornelius Van Til. And he had a couple of, uh, a couple of followers who've kind of popularized it. And it's really, it's really kind of entered into the mainstream. So I'm sure if you, if you have your ears to the tracks, you know, you'll start picking up little pieces of this. Uh, here and there. So um, I kind of got interested in it, you know, at first because I was interested in apologetics and counter apologetics, but then also because of, you know, my, my, my philosophical interests. So it raises all sorts of interesting issues, um, healthy, he healthy issues to, uh, um, to wrestle with. And so, yeah, I, I put together a, a video on TAG, the Transcendental Argument for God, I don't know if you've if you've seen that, but uh, I've seen part of that. But I, I'll be okay. I'll definitely watch it. And I'll put a link to it beneath the video as well. Yeah, um, and you know, as I've reflected on it more, you know, I think I I could have done a better job, and so I've been doing some more writing, and that may turn into some some prod some product down the road, either a book or a, or a, or a longer a longer video. But I find it very interesting. It's exciting stuff, and it appeals to a lot of you know kind of cerebral. Um, theists. Um, and so I, I find that sort of challenging and, and interesting. So that's kind of what's been occupying me, occupying me lately. Hopefully you'll get an opportunity to, you know, to, to find that enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'll just um, comment this, that I, I find it fascinating that so many of those kind of arguments that you do hear from apologists, they, they seem to take this huge leap from uh, well, m maybe based on the way I'm seeing it today, you know, there should be a God, there needs to be a God for this to make sense to, it must be the Bible and Yahweh and Jesus. Like, 
I, I could absolutely um, respect someone saying, I just, I just logically think there has to be someone that made this. So, you know, there's just, it's too organized. The mathematical stuff is too genius. Um, it's just, it's an amazing place. Um, I just feel like this, you know, the, 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 all of seeing the, you know, Aurora Borealis or the birth of a baby, I just feel like there's something more to life. Um, I can respect that. I can respect people's desire to feel like there's something, something bigger beyond them, but the leap from that to the Bible is, is such a big, big gap. And, and almost everyone that I've personally heard using those arguments is a Christian trying to say, you know, life doesn't make sense without, without some kind of creator therefore Jesus. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's like, and it's, but it's interesting. It, yeah. it backfires too on, on atheists. I, I was kind of reprimanded by a, a, an atheist uh, professor in, in the Netherlands that I was ch- talking about. And he said, you know, this goes backwards too, where just because you reject Christ doesn't mean there's not a God. And I, I, I was telling about my, my deconversion. He said, so once you realize the Bible's not literally, you know, true, that that's just mythology, that 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 in no way has anything to do with there being a god or not that just means the bible's mythology and it was a good reminder for me and a lot of people i know the deconversion went from if if the bible's not it i doubt there's anything more it just it's it's posited to you as of all the religions christianity is the most logical it's the best it's the only one that really preaches grace and you know, no good works you just it's just a free gift from god no matter what you do um, you know, there's obviously problems with some of that, but just, you know, in a simplified sense, it's just a beautiful religion and it's painted. Like if this is wrong, then everything else is so worse that there's nothing else really to go after. And so that was my perspective as I kind of went from Christianity to Christianity to, I don't think there's anything out there, but, um, it was, it was a good re- reprimand from, from him to kind of say, you know, there's, there's people that take a different path on this and, you know, I, I do need to respect people's, you know, desire to, investigate you know other other religions and other uh, ways of thinking of it but it's interesting how many christians like myself have said the same thing there where it's just like if this isn't real i doubt anything else is 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 the real deal too and it's i think part of it's the jaded aspect you get jaded by you feel so tricked like people did this party line thing they fought and they told this story and we kind of are forced to inherit someone else's spirituality someone else's spiritual decisions and and it's like it you know, if, if there is another God, um, how do I know that this story hasn't been distorted, you know, dozens or hundreds of times since they first got it? And it, it, it kind of jades you a little bit, kind of gives you a little sick, sick uh, sense in your stomach and, and taste in your mouth that, you know, something's going to have to really like, like people have asked, you know, what would it take for you to believe in a God? It's like, it would have to be pretty clear. Like, I don't know what it is. And, and I'm, other people have said this, but I would know when I saw it. Um, but I don't know what it is, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to get sucked in quickly or easily to anything, whether it's crystals or, you know, the force or anything, nothing really appeals to me. And if there is something that's going to have to do a, you know, a very, very clear job that this is something other than what I've ever seen before. But. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, amen, brother. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Deconversion is, you could think of deconversion as just sort of getting to zero. Yes. And, and now the, now the real journey begins and you know uh for me it's a a question of examining various philosophical issues these these are logical things that humans have been wrestling with um, since there were humans you know and if you want to talk about a a revealed god a god who's going to reveal himself then i always thought the question well what would it take to make you believe was grossly unfair because it says the burden is not on me to specify what it would take if there is such a being, uh, he would know exactly. We have, he, you know, he, he could blow my mind uh, very easily. Yeah. So you know, we'll just leave that in his lap until he's until he's ready to do that. In the meantime, all I can do is work with what I've got. Yeah, exactly. A very good way to put it. Well, um, I I just want to say again to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for what you did today and sharing your heart on some of these issues and you know some of the the different. Uh, areas of study that you've you've put it so much thought into uh people like me just it's 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 been so helpful it's not just a hobby of mine it really makes a difference to what um what i'm thinking through and what what it impacts you know because i've still got family in this stuff it helps me to think through it and uh, so thank you for what you do in general and i just want to say personally thank you for 
your impact on my deconversion. Um, it was a direct, it wasn't um, uh, after the fact, it was before my deconversion, you had a direct influence. So thank you for changing my life in a very, very positive way. Um, and just, just to add to that, I had more peace in the first week than I did in 43 years as a Christian. <laughs> oh, <So. clears throat> that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So. You made you made my day more, more than my day. That's terrific. Thank you, Tim. Stay in touch. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks again. All Have right. a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.